are being said and things are being implied and things are being threatened, the likes of which we really haven't heard before. How real is the war of words with North Korea? The top U.S. military brass says North Korea has not changed its military posture despite the recent escalation of tensions on the Korean peninsula. General Joseph Dunford, chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, says North Korea has shown no signs of unusual military activity. In terms of the situation on the peninsula now, can you give us your, your judgment of where we are today? given the statements back and forth between leaders of both countries, given our aerial operations off the coast, given the response yesterday that could trigger a reaction by the North Koreans. Can you give us an assessment? Senator, Senator I can. Uh, you know, while the political space is, is clearly very charged right now, we haven't seen a change in the posture of North Korean forces. Uh, we watched that very carefully. His comments to the Senate Armed Services Committee on Tuesday contrast the view of Seoul's intelligence agency, which believes the regime has ramped up its military activity near the East Sea. Despite this, the general said the U.S. is staying watchful and vigilant and has taken appropriate measures to protect itself and its allies in the region. Uh, we clearly have postured our forces to respond in the event of a provocation uh, or a conflict. Uh, we also have taken all the proper measures to protect uh, our allies, uh, the South Koreans, the Japanese, the force, as well as Americans in the area. Uh, but, but what we haven't seen uh, is military activity that would be reflective of the charged political environment that you're describing. Dunford also warned that North Korea represents Washington's greatest national security threat, and it should be assumed the rogue state can already hit the U.S. mainland with ballistic missiles. I'd, I'd have to ask you how confident you are in the in our intelligence uh, uh, community's ability to monitor and detect just where they are and how accurate you believe that end of 2018 is. Hey, Senator, from my review of the intelligence, I, I think that uh, what General Hyten said and what you've just described reflects the collective judgment of, uh, of the senior leadership in the department. And I, and I think something that uh, General Hyten said is something I've also said in public is that whether it's three months or six months or 18 months, mm -hmm. it is soon. And, uh, and we ought to conduct ourselves as though it is just a matter of time and a matter of very short time before North Korea has that capability. Yeah. He said there's a consensus among intelligence communities Pyongyang will have fully capable and reliable ICBMs ready within a period of months. Although the regime's missile technology, especially those related to atmospheric reentry, has yet to fully mature, Dunford said there were no doubts North Korea will develop the required engineering solutions. Senator, I think for all planning purposes, capability development, we should assume now that North Korea has the capability. As you suggest, there are some technical elements of their program that haven't been fully tested, from a re-entry vehicle to some of the ability to stabilize uh, a missile in flight. But, but I view all those as engineering solutions that will be developed over time. And frankly, I think we should assume today that North Korea has that capability and has the will to use that capability. The last major modification of our homeland missile defenses came in 2013, when in response to an accelerating threat from North Korea, then Secretary Hagel announced plans to increase the number of interceptors from 30 to 44. And given what we've witnessed over the past year, do you believe that the current threat environment requires additional homeland missile defense capabilities? I do, Senator. And, and over the last uh, seven or eight weeks, uh, we did a very detailed look at uh, increasing ballistic missile defense capability uh, for the North Korean threat, certainly, but for other threats as well. And we do think an increase uh, is warranted. And I believe in the NDAA, and we certainly support that, there's an additional 21 interceptors that's, that are in the, uh, the NDAA that was just passed. The general also agreed with the notion that Kim Jong-un's main motivation for pursuing nuclear weapons is the survival of his regime. He said the military fully supports the Trump administration's efforts to find a peaceful resolution to the crisis through diplomatic pressure, warning of the serious risks associated with the preemptive strike. Your Senator, based on the current capacity uh, of the North Koreans, the current threat, so both the type of the threat and the, amount of, <clears throat> and the amount of missiles that they possess, we can protect Hawaii today against an ICBM. We can protect the continental United States against an ICBM. U.S. Defense Secretary Jim Mattis says the United States seeks a peaceful resolution to escalating tensions with North Korea, despite Pyongyang's claim that a tweet by President Donald Trump on Monday was tantamount to a declaration of war. 
In New Delhi, for talks with Indian officials about strengthening U.S.-India ties, Mattis said while the United States military presence on the Korean Peninsula is necessary to deter North Korea's threats, it also supports diplomatic efforts to resolve the conflict peacefully. On Monday, President Donald Trump commented on Twitter that North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's regime won't be around much longer if the North carried out its recent threats. Speaking to reporters near United Nations headquarters in New York, North Korean Foreign Minister Ri Young-ho said given the fact that this comes from someone who is currently holding the seat of the United States presidency, this is clearly a declaration of war. How much importance should be put on this war of words? That's what VOA Asia's Ira Melman asks Evans Revere, a senior advocate of the Albright Stonebridge Group and a former senior U.S. diplomat. I don't think too much is made being made of, uh, of this uh, escalating rhetoric. Uh, it is we're in a serious situation right now in which uh, things are being said and things are being implied and things are being threatened, the likes of which we really haven't heard before, and that's troubling, uh, particularly when each side seems to be uh, trying to outdo the other in terms of rhetorical excess, uh, and that's that's highly problematic uh, when you've got. Uh, a, uh, a situation on the Korean Peninsula that is as tense as it is uh, when you have North Korea, which unlike 5 or 10 or 15 years ago, has some uh, missile and nuclear capabilities that it did not have in the past and is actually able to deliver uh, potentially on some of the threats that it poses or the threats that it has voiced uh, in, in, in recent days. So this is, this is a troubling uh, period. Uh, it's important to try to figure out a way to, to de-escalate this crisis. Uh, the greatest threat that we have right now is the threat of, uh, of miscalculation or misperception on the part of one side or the other side. Uh, and as this uh, rhetoric continues to e escalate, it, it creates an, uh, an almost uh, a cycle, if you will, of, of increasing rhetorical excess. Uh, and that, that doesn't go to a good place. And so it's important to try to uh, figure out a way to, 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 to put, uh, put the pause button on here. Well, the definition of rhetorical excess uh, could have, can be applied to the leader of Pyongyang for, for many years now, or however many years he has, he has been in power. But the difference here seems to be coming from the White House. How, do you, how does that figure in? How does that escalate at all? Well, uh, as somebody who's been working on long, uh, North Korea for a long time, uh, I, I'm intimately familiar in, in several languages with some of the threats that they've made over the years. Uh, in the past, uh, their practice has been uh, when they get into a difficult place, when they're feeling weak or threatened, uh, they engage in, in uh, rhetorical overkill. Uh, but in the past, we were able to discount that. Uh, because they didn't have the capabilities to actually do what they were threatening to do. But now we have a situation, as you've rightly pointed out, in which their uh, rhetoric is being matched almost word for word with rhetoric of our own. And we have the United States, uh, and particularly the United States president, unfortunately, uh, acting in a fashion that previous presidents have not acted. And by, by using uh, these words, by making these suggestions, by implying certain things, uh, in, in a way that's very uncharacteristic of presidential behavior in the past. And this has put a, a big question mark over, over developments on the Korean Peninsula because we don't know where all this is headed. Does China still have the ability to make a difference? Uh, I come down on the side that, of the debate that suggests that China could do more. Uh, it's influence over North Korea may not be as great as it once was, but I don't know of any other actor who has as much influence as China has, despite their support for some of the Security Council resolutions, despite some of the critical comments that the Chinese have made. Uh, the Chinese, uh, if you talk to them privately, as I have, say that they feel that excessive pressure could bring about uh, un what they regard as a nightmarish situation on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and that situation is a collapsed or collapsing North Korean regime. That's China's nightmare. Uh, China doesn't like the fact that North Korea has nuclear weapons and missiles. It doesn't like the fact that North Korea threatens to use those uh, weapons. But what China really doesn't like is the possibility of chaos and collapse on its border. And towards that end, the Chinese have been reluctant partners 
in putting pressure on North Korea via sanctions. And so you have this this disconnect between the United States and China about the the, the basic tool that the United States feels is essential to convince the North Koreans to go down a different path. Evans Revere is senior advisor to the Albright Stovridge Group and a former senior U.S. diplomat. Evans, thanks so much for being with us here. Thank you very much.